You're probably wondering why I'm up here. You don't have to listen to me speak again this week, so you're off the hook there. <laughs> this church is filled with love, huh? I get the priv privilege of introducing the uh, next dynamic speaker for today. And I know this gentleman has gone through extensive theological training. I know this because I know where he is born. I've listened to him speak so many times. I know that he loves the Lord. It is my one and only son, Jacob Ricketts. <laughs> okay, he's not my only son. All right. <laughs> but anyway, Jacob, come on up. And Jacob did bring his own entourage. Gee. Uh, but uh, of those that don't know my parents, these are my parents right here, Ed and Pat Ricketts. Stand up. They didn't come to listen to me speak last week, but they came for their grandson. So Jacob, um, you better be good. Hello. Whoa. Is that better? All right. Can you hear me now? All right. We did it. We're good. Yeah, tech, moral and technical support. Well, good morning. Um, I'm really excited to speak here today, and it's exciting for me to be able to share with you. Um, so as I was preparing for this and praying, God really brought a section of Scripture to my heart that um, I hadn't really studied before, and so I'm hoping that it'll uh, bless everyone here today. So I don't need to tell you all, but America is in a very tumultuous time right now. You know, in just a couple days, we're going to elect the next president, and no matter who wins, half of the country is going to be upset and angry. And there's going to be uh, hatred and, and anger spewed out all over the internet. People will be claiming that one party is corrupt, another party is evil. It's going to be ugly. And many people, in, including some of those in, in the church, in the Christian church, are worried or scared about the outcome of the election and how this will affect our nation or our individual lives. So how are we as Christians supposed to operate in a culture like this? Well, today we're going to be looking at a story that's probably familiar to many of us. Um, and sometimes when we're familiar with a passage of Scripture, it's easy to kind of gloss over it and, and miss some of the significance that's actually there. So I'm hoping we'll be able to learn a little bit more about this particular story. So if you have your Bibles or your phones or whatever you use, uh, turn with me to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. So, just to set up a little bit of what's going on during this story. This, is, this story is told during Jesus' life. And at this time in history, Israel, the nation of Israel, was being ruled by Rome. Rome was in charge. This story is also told as the week before Passover, which is the big, the big Jewish holiday. It's their, it's their Christmas, in a way. And it's told in the, in the city of Jerusalem, the capital. And there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in this city at this time. This is the week just before Jesus is about to be crucified. He had just entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey, and people had been proclaiming him as king. He had cleansed the temple. He, he went in and kicked out all the people who were taking advantage of the people who wanted to just worship God. And he had been preaching through the city. The, his... 
Jesus' conflict with the religious leaders of that time sort of coming to a head. This is the pinnacle. At this point, they want him dead, and they're going to figure out a way to do it. So we're going to be reading Mark chapter 12. We're going to start at verse 13. Hello? All right, let's do it this way. All right, so Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 13, and I'm reading from the NIV translation. It said, Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. So let's pray. Dear Lord, I just pray that you would bless this time in your word. I pray that you would reveal to us what you want us to hear and that you would speak through my words, God. Please, please help my thoughts and my ideas to disappear and your, your ideas and your thoughts to rise to the surface. In Jesus' name, amen. So on the surface, it seems like this passage is about paying taxes. And it is to a certain degree, but there's a lot more going on here than it might first seem. Jesus is actually speaking about our identity in the kingdom of God. So we're going to walk through this, and we're going to see how he does that, does that and why the people were amazed by what he said. So verse 13 says, Later they sent some Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. So here we see two groups being sent to Jesus, the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now, who were these guys? Well, the Pharisees and the Herodians were political opponents. Um, on one hand, you have the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders of the day. They were the teachers. Um, and they, they didn't like Rome being in charge. They, they would tolerate it as long as they could, as long as they could practice their religious beliefs. They were, they were okay. But really what they wanted is they wanted Israel to be an independent nation with, with a Jewish king again. And on the other hand, you have the Herodians. These guys were in support of the Herods, who were the non-Jewish rulers that the Romans put in charge. So you have the Pharisees, who want to be independent nation with a Jewish king, and you have the Herodians, who want Rome to be in charge. Now, why were these groups sent to Jesus? Well, that's because they were asking Jesus a political question. And they were doing this to get him in trouble. So verse 14, it says... They came to him and said, Teacher, we know you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. So they start by trying to butter Jesus up, right? They say, oh, you're a man of integrity. You speak the truth. But what they're really trying to do is corner Jesus. They're, they're, Jesus at this point is teaching in front of a crowd, and they come up and they say, you're not afraid of giving a straight answer. You tell it like it is. Now we're going to ask you a question. And so they're doing this so that way if Jesus doesn't answer their question, he would look foolish. So they're forcing him to answer the question that they're about to ask. And so their question is, verse 14, is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Now they didn't ask this question to get an answer, but they were asking to get Jesus in trouble. They weren't asking about just any tax. They were asking about a specific tax. It's the imperial tax. And this tax was very controversial in the day. It was a tax that only had to be paid once a year, and it was only required of, of subjects of Rome, people who had been conquered, but not Rome 
Roman citizens themselves. It wasn't a very expensive tax. It wasn't a heavy burden, but it was symbolic of giving your allegiance and your, and your devotion to Caesar, the leader of Rome. Essentially, it was a tax for, for the priv privilege of being conquered by Rome. And 25 years prior to this moment, when they, when they instituted this tax, there was a revolt against it, which was man led by a man named Judas of Galilee. And this is a different Judas than Jesus' disciple, different, different guy. And this movement became, or this, this uh, revolt became a movement called the Zealots. And what the Zealots wanted is they didn't want to be ruled by Rome. They wanted to be ruled by God. They wanted Israel to be a nation under God, the kingdom of God. And, they, and because of that, they said taxes were only due to God. They should only be paid to God, not to Rome. The, the zealots, they hated the Romans, even to the point where they hated people who were sympathetic to Rome, or at least trying to just get along. These, the zealots were, would perform acts of terror. They would um, perform assassinations. So in, in short, the zealots were violent radicals that wanted to over, start a revolution to overthrow the government. Kind of sounds like some groups we have nowadays. So Judas the Galilean was eventually caught and killed and executed, but the zealot movement continued. And so for the, for the next 20, 25 years, the zealots have been going around, making trouble, and trying to bring up this issue about this tax. Should we pay or shouldn't we? It's immoral. And now Jesus comes along. Jesus came from Galilee, just like Judas the Galilean had. Jesus was preaching about the kingdom of God through his entire ministry, just like the zealots had been talking about. Jesus was just hailed as king when he entered Jerusalem, and he caused a ruckus in the temple. So because of all this stuff, the zealots were very interested in Jesus. They thought, maybe this is the guy that's going to kick Rome out of our country. He's the one who's going to set things straight. And in fact, one of Jesus' 12 disciples was a man, Simon the Zealot. He was, he was one of these, one, uh, he was a part of this group. And so the, the leaders, they see all this, they see these correlations, and so they go to him and ask, so what do you think about the imperial tax? They're asking him about a tax, but really they're asking him, are you going to start a revolution? And now Jesus is in a tough spot because he says, if he says, no, don't pay the tax, well, that will be seen as he's a revolutionary, and now Rome has got to stop him. But if he, sees, if he says, well, yes, go ahead and pay the tax, then he would be seen as a charlatan, as a fraud, and his followers would, would desert him. Now, why, why would his followers do that? Well, nowadays, Jesus had been, if you remember, Jesus had been talking about the kingdom of God through his entire ministry. And nowadays, when we talk about the kingdom of God, we think of a spiritual kingdom, right? We think spiritual things. But we're looking at that from our modern mindset. We have 2,000 years between us and them. That's not how the people thought in those days. It, back then, when Jesus or, or anybody talked about the kingdom of God, the people were picturing a literal, physical kingdom, a nation that was ruled by God. They are picturing a country, or at least somebody who represented God, right, the Messiah. So when Jesus was preaching about the kingdom of God, the Jews were picturing a kingdom or a nation where there was justice for the oppressed, freedom for the enslaved, where the poor were provided for and those who were hurting could find healing. Again, they pictured a kingdom, a nation where God's love and righteousness was on display and where it could be launched into the world. And Jesus himself said that this is what his kingdom would be like. In Luke 4, this is near the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he read from the book of Isaiah. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So throughout all his, his teaching and preaching, when Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God, his followers were imagining finally getting out from underneath the rule of Rome and Israel becoming a world superpower again, led by God. That's why the Zealots were so interested in Jesus. 
They were excited about this idea. They thought he was going to overthrow Rome. So not only that, not only did they mis, uh, misidentify what Jesus was talking about with the kingdom of God, but in those days, kings and rulers, and they, they claimed to either be, have been chosen by gods or they claimed to be gods themselves. Caesar was doing this. Caesar was claiming he was a god. And since these rulers were allegedly chosen by the gods or they were gods, then they were, their authority was absolute and unquestionable. You couldn't question them. They were beyond reproach. How can you argue against the will of the gods, right? So being a citizen of the kingdom, if you were a citizen of a kingdom, it meant complete and utter submission to their ruler and their gods. If you were a citizen, then your allegiance, your devotion, and in some cases your worship was demanded and expected to the leader and their gods. So in the Jews' mind, if they submitted to Rome, then you couldn't be a citizen of, of the kingdom of God. You had to pick one or the other. So now you can see the conundrum that Jesus is in. This question they asked is much more than whether or not they should pay a tax. This question, or if Jesus says, yes, pay the tax, the people would think that he was supporting Caesar as God. And then all that talk about the kingdom of God was just a bunch of hot air. But on the other hand, if he says, no, don't pay the tax, he would be a revolutionary, and the, and the Roman authorities would crush him. It's a really good trap, actually. It's a really good question. And you can see they're pushing him for a simple answer. They said in verse 15, should we pay the tax or shouldn't we? Yes or no, Jesus? Just yes or no. So let's look at Jesus' answer. And continuing on in verse 15, it says, but Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Now, this is sort of a side note, but Jesus understood what, what they were doing here. He knew that the Pharisees and the Herodians, they didn't care about his answer. They were trying to make him look bad. And this revealed a heart issue in these, in these groups. They weren't going to change their mind about Jesus, regardless of how he answered. It didn't matter. And we see these questions all the time nowadays especially during election years. You see these questions asked on the news. You see this all over the place in social media, even just in conversations at work, at school. There are questions about events and beliefs and plans and scandals, and nobody cares about the answers. And Jesus understood, and, and we need to understand, that when people have heart issues to the point where they don't care about answers, then answers don't matter. It's not a solution. Debate isn't a solution, and facts aren't a solution. We can argue till we're blue in the face, and they're not going to change their mind. So if someone has a heart issue to the point where they don't care, we need to minister to their heart and not to their head. And we need to pray that God can do the work that only he can do in changing someone's heart. And in, in addition, we need to make sure that we ourselves are not the ones with the heart issue, that we aren't the ones who are asking questions with, when we don't care about answers. I know I've done this before. We should be asking questions to understand the people who we disagree with, not just trying to make them look foolish. So continuing on, verse 15, Jesus said, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. So they brought the coin, and he asked them, whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. So the denarius was a silver coin. It wasn't a lot of money. It represented just one day of, of simple labor. But the coin on the front of it had, had a picture of, Caesar, of Tiberius Caesar, who was a Caesar at the time. And on the front, it said, Tiberius Caesar son of the high, uh, of the divine Augustus. It's literally saying, Caesar is the son of God. And on the back, it said Pontifex Maximus, which means high priest. So this is literally blasphemous money. It's saying, Caesar, son of God, the high priest. So imagine this scene. We're in Jerusalem. There's hundreds of thousands of people in this city. Jesus is speaking to a crowd. This 
this question about this tax has been bubbling underneath the surface for 20, 25 years. You have some zealots who are there wanting Jesus to overthrow the, the government. You have the Herodians there who want Rome in charge. And you have Jesus, and he asks for this denarius. Jesus, who's the actual king of kings, doesn't even have a single coin in his pocket. He has to ask for it. And he's holding this coin that says, Tiberius, Caesar, is God, and he's the high priest. When you have Jesus himself, who is the true son of God and the true high priest, and people are pushing him. They're saying, Jesus, are you a revolutionary, or are you going to renounce the kingdom of God? What are you picking? So how did Jesus answer? In verse 17, Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Now, why were they amazed? It wasn't because Jesus used some clever wording to escape this dilemma. They were amazed because Jesus' answer was revolutionary. The Jews thought if they paid this tax with this blasphemous coin, that they were affirming Caesar is God, Caesar is the high priest, and that they were all in with Rome. They were a part of Rome, and they were being forced to pay this tax. But Jesus is saying, no, it doesn't have to work that way. In the original Greek, when Jesus said, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's, what he's saying is, give Caesar what he deserves, but give God what he deserves. So what are the things that God deserves? Well, God deserves a lot of things. He deserves our love. He deserves our devotion. He deserves our worship. But Jesus is referring to something even deeper than that. Jesus was holding that denarius saying, Caesar deserves it. It was made in his image. It literally has his picture on it. But God deserves you because you were made in his image. Way back in Genesis, God says, So God created mankind in his own image. In, his imi in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The denarius was a coin for Caesar's kingdom, but we are the coins for God's kingdom. When Jesus answered this way, the people were amazed because he was clearly telling people he's not going to start a re revolution. He's not going to overthrow Rome. Pay the tax. And yet, at the same time, Jesus is saying, but a revolution is coming. The kingdom of God is still coming. But it wasn't going to be the kind of kingdom that the world had ever seen before. The kingdom wasn't going to be a nation. It was going to exist within his people and spread throughout the world. And it would be through this kingdom, through his people, that there would be justice for the oppressed and freedom for the enslaved. It would be through his people that the hungry would be fed and the naked would be clothed. It would be through his people that God's love and righteousness would be on display for the world and spread everywhere. This was a revolutionary idea, and they were amazed. So what does this mean for us today? Well, clearly, Caesar deserved some things, and our government deserves some things. So we have responsibilities here, like paying taxes, voting, doing our civic duties. They deserve these things. And at the same time, we must never forget that we were made by God in the image of God for the kingdom of God. We were made to proclaim the good news, to bring justice for the oppressed, to meet the needs of the poor, and to display God's love and righteousness to the world. So what does that look like in practice? Well, it looks like a lot of different things. It could be some life-altering things. Like for Kelly and I, it was adopting. For some, it's moving overseas for a full-time ministry or moving because God has asked you to, maybe caring for your grandchildren full-time. For some, It could just be simple inconvenient or uncomfortable things like paying for someone's groceries or traveling to another country to build some houses or churches. It could be filling a box and sending it across the, across the world to bless some child. It could be forgiving those who hurt us. It could be loving those who vote differently than us. Or it could just be spending some time with someone who is lonely. So the question for us today 
is which kingdom have we given our, our allegiance to? What have we put our hope in, and where have we placed our devotion? Have we given Caesar too much? Or to make it more personal, have we given our president too much? Have we given a political party too much? No matter what happens in the next couple days, God is still going to be king, and we will still be a part of his kingdom. The oppressed will still need justice. The poor will still need provisions. The good news will still need to be pro proclaimed, and the world will still need to see God's love and righteousness. America is a great country. It's not a perfect country, but it's a great country. And we are blessed to live here at this time in history. But we were not made for this country. We were made for his kingdom. So let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you that you have recorded these stories for us to learn from. Thank you that you made us to be in your kingdom. What a privilege it is to be a part of your kingdom and to do your kingdom work. I pray that you would help us to be responsible citizens in our country and to be effective citizens in your kingdom. Thank you that you have allowed us to be a part of your kingdom, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You have been listening to Pastor Teacher Dr. Sandy Shoemaker from Park Community Church, located in Shingle Springs, California. If this message has touched you in any way and you would like more information about the Christian life, or if you would like to submit a prayer request, please do not hesitate to contact us at church at parkcommunity.org. If you would like to acquire more information about our church, please visit our website at parkcommunity.org.